Hello, friends. Welcome to Microdose episode five. This is a follow up to the episode on the strength card. And we're going to be looking at how we can love all of our creative parts. What I'm doing with these shorter episodes or attempting to do is to take that big mural that we paint in the interview episodes with lots of nuance, lots of facets, lots of different little portals and visual stimulations and really zero in on something that I hope can feel like a way to practically apply some of this medicine and wisdom of the card to your life, to your creative life, usually more specifically. So I hope you noticed if you listened to the strength episode and if you haven't listened to it, I recommend it. You don't have to hear it first, but it's a good one. Check it out. What we talked a lot about was bringing a kind of tenderness and acceptance and unconditional love to parts of the self that maybe we have been avoiding or we have exiled into some psychological basement inside of us, which really only works for a certain amount of time. And then there comes a point when we're ready to kind of get real about what is all here. We usually don't do that all at once. We do it in bits at a time and it becomes a lifelong journey of healing, uh, not a one and done situation. We're going to kind of think about that with like uh, the our, our creative our creative life and the way that we show up to our creative work. So I'm drawing on uh, the framework of internal family systems, which basically allows us to think about who we are divided into all of these different parts and smaller personalities that each play a function in how we move through the world and how we guide ourselves and how we do things, how we protect ourselves some of those parts of us are consciously cultivated on one level. Like, you know, we know that we care about something and we really, or, or we value something and we really try to cultivate, let's say, a uh, aspect of ourselves that is a leader or is public facing or has um, some purpose to speak or share messages, you know, maybe like a hierophant person, a leader, a communicator is a, let's say, consciously cultivated part of the self. That could be true. But then we also have these unconsciously cultivated parts of the self that are either just like naturally existing or they were created to help us get through a difficult situation. So for example, like My parents split up when I was very young, and I think that really affected me. And I bought into this idea that conflict was just very, like interpersonal conflict was very devastating, very ruinous because my parents fought and then they divorced. And I found that to be very sad. (laughs) Um, And so my belief, I developed this belief that like interpersonal conflict will have these gigantic ruptures because I didn't see also a lot of other conflict that was like just moving things forward and helping people work things out. I only heard these like conflicts behind the door and then suddenly my mom and dad don't live together anymore. So little Cecily developed this part of her who is very quiet and very watchful and was not going to get into interpersonal conflicts with people. So that's a part of me, you know, we could call that like the shy, timid one or the wallflower. I I can give this part of myself like a name. Let's call her the wallflower. She doesn't want to rock the boat. She doesn't want to create conflict. She doesn't want to explode things. So that would be like an unconsciously cultivated part of self that's based in something rooted in fear. Like, I don't want to experience future relational rifts like my parents' divorce, so I don't create conflict. Like, that's kind of how that part would have developed to protect me from other such bad things as I perceive them to be happening, from happening, right? So that's kind of how parts work. These different uh, aspects of self 
that are consciously created or not that have a function either to protect us or advance our goals. And we have parts inside of us that are working at odds with one another, you know, like my wallflower part and my hierophant part that wants to get out here and be on the mic and be speaking, uh, they would not agree on things, right? <laughs> and maybe after I record an episode, the wallflower part of me is like, Ugh. like what have I done? Someone's going to hate what I said. Someone's going to send me a terrible email and be mad at me and like ruin my business. I don't really have thoughts like that, thankfully, but that's an example of how two parts could be um, working at cross purposes with one another, right? And so when we have that going on and we're not aware of it, we often get into like situations of self-sabotage. Like we have a part that wants to go forward and we have a part that does not want us to do anything risky. And so we'll find unconscious ways to kind of shut things down. So I'm inviting us. And what happens in internal family systems is that we just start to look at, well, maybe what part is showing up right now? And what is it trying to manage for us? Is it trying to put out a fire? Is it trying to like play defense? Um, what is it doing and what does it want to protect us from? And when we start to become aware of those things, then we can see, you know, maybe what's going on inside of us and why certain things are happening the way that they're, they are. And we can bring them from unconscious, an unconscious state, we're not aware of them, to awareness and that doesn't always take us to the, the the goal line, let's say, but it creates a huge shift. Once we have awareness, we can start to do all kinds of things. So what I'm inviting us to do around our creative parts is to imagine first what those parts are. And I really like to take a creative approach to internal family systems. I think it's a creative undertaking. I think that's one reason why it's really effective. There's no way to like dissect ourselves and know exactly what our parts are and how many we have and exactly what they're about or how they're different from each other. We have to imagine, we have to kind of get into a creative mode to even start to identify these parts and start to work with them. So this is a creative practice for looking at our creative parts. And what I'm going to invite you to do is to name eight different creative parts of yourself. And I'm choosing the number eight because eight is the number on the strength card. It's a nice even number. And I think it pushes us past just a couple and kind of forces a creative process to really like, yeah, imagine more and just see what's in there. Um, again, there's no right answers, right? So I want to make sure as you're thinking about these eight creative parts, and I'm going to give you some examples, that at least some of these are, and ideally like at least four of them, like half of them, are parts of you that feel exciting to you, that you already love. <laughs> uh, maybe you could love them more actively, but you don't have a lot of shame about them. Um, these are the parts that show up excited to create, that have goals and visions and desires that you feel pretty good about. And then there's probably going to be four other parts that show up to kind of slow things down or keep you from taking big risks. And so identifying both of those hopefully will be interesting and fun and help you start to work with some of the different parts. Like there might be a part or two that is particularly slowing you down. So you can sort of focus on working with those a little bit to shift something. If say your creative practice is not feeling as fulfilling or exciting or forward moving as you would like. So here's a few examples of parts that might be disruptive to your creative practice. And again, I'm making up names for these. I'm trying to be cute. I don't know if this will entertain you or not, <laughs> but one of them is the capitalist overlord. And this is the part of you that wants you to make money, 
this is a part of you that understands that you live in capitalism and you have to pay your rent or your mortgage and you have to pay bills if you want to have, you know, a decent life with some level of comfort and the ability to do things that interest you. So your capitalist overlord is like checking your bank account is also thinking that if you're going to be spending your time on anything, it should be something that's making you money or it should be clearly a vacation. Like this capitalist overlord is like trying to extract as much money making potential out of you as possible because you have to save for your old age. You have to save for the possibility of a medical emergency, which if you live in America, it can be devastating <laughs> to your finances. That's not funny. Uh, it's just so sad that sometimes it's funny or so sad that we have to laugh, I guess. Um, so that would be a part of you that wants you to only be creating if you feel like it can turn into something profitable, like a book that you can sell or artwork, you know, any, <laughs> any kind of like form of art that you can sell. Uh, so your capitalist overlord would be showing up to kind of be like, is this good enough? Are people going to like this? This isn't going to make you money. You should be doing something else with your time right now. And so that would shut down the creative process if that part of you uh, really has enough stage time. There might be uh, a part of you that really needs and wants to be liked. I made up the name. Nelly needs to be liked. This is the name of this part. <laughs> I identify with this part very much. Um, and so if you have had in your past an experience where you really felt cut off from something, you really felt ashamed, embarrassed, humbled, uh, like you, you felt like you were something was wrong with you, because of a because of someone not liking you, because of someone not approving. Sometimes we have long-term relationships with people who are constantly reminding us that they don't really like us. Or maybe they do like us, but they're they're only going to tell us that they don't or show us that they don't. And so then there becomes this hunger to like please people and to make sure that people like us enough so we can be accepted, so we can feel a sense of belonging. That's a basic fundamental human need. So it's very normal and natural to want to be liked. That's not like nothing's wrong with you if you have this part. <laughs> uh, it's very normal. It comes from a biological need. Similarly to the capitalist overlord. I mean, money isn't a necessarily like biological need, but in the capitalist world we live, it basically is. So, uh, and our brains understand that. So anyway, Nelly needs to be liked. If she's part of your uh, creative entourage, she would show up to be asking, are they going to like this? Is this good enough? What will people think of this? Is your family going to approve of this? Are you writing about your family and maybe they'll all disown you if you aren't nice enough about the truth you're trying to tell? So when that voice comes in, you're going to get stifled because part of you wants to tell your truth and put your truth on paper. If you're writing a memoir, let's say, like that's a creative impulse you legitimately have, like emotionally and psychologically to both process your experience and share it and make it useful to someone else. But then Nelly needs to be liked is like in your ear, what are people going to think? Is your whole family going to cut you off if you write this? And then you're like, well, how do I say this in a nice way? Because to say it in a real nice way isn't super honest. And to be really honest means you risk something big. So then maybe you're not writing for a while because you're trying to figure this out or you're trying to wait to have the courage to write it in a truthful way or you're waiting to come up with the language that can both be truthful and manage to compel people to still like you, right? So that's how that part might function. Here's a couple examples of a part that would be very exciting. Um... This was when I came up with, I'm not a visual artist, but I was, this was just fun to think about. Like maybe you're a color slut. 
I just made this up. I'm trying to <laughs> uh, unshame the word slut for one thing, but maybe you just love color. Like you love looking at color. You love thinking about color. You love how different colors pair together. When you walk into spaces for the first time, you're always looking at the color. Sometimes you're in spaces where the color combinations just like light you up every cell of your body. And so this part of you, uh, if you're, let's say if you're a visual artist shows up to play with color and to have fun and to explore color and to pair colors and blend colors and like just have a field day with color. So this is a creative part that like brings you to the canvas or brings you to your paints or your markers or whatever with a lot of excitement and an urge to experiment. So that's wonderful. So if you take the color slut who wants to just play with colors and see what happens and make really like stimulating color com combinations through your artwork, and then you have your capitalist overlord coming up to be like, uh, who's going to pay you to just like make colors? Then your creative process gets... Um, gets fraught, which is okay. Sometimes we're going to have a fraught creative process, but it is not um, the way to help you move forward with your creative desires, right? So the activity, the exercise I'm inviting you to do is to come up with eight different parts that might be showing up in your creative practice. Four of them should feel like the ones who are into the fun, into the creative act, have the desire, have the passion, have the interest, like they're really interested in something. They have the energy. Think about four of them. How could you kind of separate out four parts of yourself? Give them fun names. Start to think about, I would start just by listing the names maybe. And then also think about four parts of yourself that are often showing up to muck things up, to slow things down, to protect you, to prevent you from feeling future pain, to make sure that you're doing a good job or that you're doing it right. And also give them a cute, funny, entertaining name. You can probably do a better job than I did. And then I want you to make a family portrait <laughs> where eight, all eight of these parts are in the picture. And you probably remember when like you were a kid and uh, people, adults always asked you like, draw your home and your family. And you would draw like the house and a tree and the dog. And then you would put all the people in your family in the picture. Same thing, but you don't have to do the house if you don't want to. Um, but you want to get these eight parts of yourself in the frame Draw them how you think they would dress or look. You Even if you're not good at art like me, just make a messy sketch. Like get out some colors, make some shapes. They can all look really weird. They can look like kind of an alien family. That's okay. This is a way to like identify them and give them substance and start to look at them from outside of yourself. Because right now they're just living inside you telling you what to do and you don't see them. They just sound like your normal voice, your normal mind thinking. <laughs> and now you're going to put them in a picture where you can say like, oh no, that's capitalist overlord, which is not the fullness of me. That's just a little part of me. So I want you to draw them how you want to imagine them and spend some time just like relating to that. And then I want you to choose a couple, choose maybe the two that feel like they're hindering you the most. And I would pull them out and do their own portraits. And maybe you draw them on half a sheet of paper. And then the other half is for writing, where you're kind of writing in their voice. You're letting them talk and you're letting them say what they need to say. Uh, they have messages for you. Just let that come out. Like, what is the capitalist overlord going to say if they're given a monologue on stage? Just kind of write that out. Let them speak. This is going to help you um, recognize their voice more often. And then somewhere in that page or on the other side of the page, I want you to write down how you want this part to show up. Like a capitalist overlord, on the one hand, 
like if it does have a helpful function, it's to help us make money, which isn't a bad thing. Like it's okay to want money. It's okay. Like we all need it. Um, so if we have an enterprising part of ourselves that has some capitalistic awareness and can help us navigate the hellscape of capitalism, then, you know, there are ways to do that ethically and in alignment with your values. So you've let the capitalist overlord on this, uh, where he gets his own portrait. Suddenly it's a he. Um, he says all the monologue of stuff he wants to say. And then somewhere separately on that page on the back, write down some ways that you would like this part of you to show up in a little more well-rounded fashion. So maybe like the more healthy ways I would like my capitalist overlord to show up would be to be enterprising, to be strategic, uh, to be innovative, to be able to happily receive money, um, to not feel guilty when people pay me, right? So those would be some ways where we've given the capitalist overlord his time to speak. And then we refine, we bring our imagination to how we would like him to maybe show up a little differently. That doesn't necessarily mean he will right away, maybe ever, I don't know. But just the process of going through this creative exploration, looking at your creative parts, I want you to sit with that family portrait and be like, yeah, that's me. This is all here. This is what's like part of the process. And some of these family members are not making it easy all the time, but I am interested in bringing this family together. I'm interested in honoring all of these parts, all of these family members. There's a way that I can love each of them and find a place for them that's supportive and uh, more equitable. You know, so someone's not like just bringing negative energy to the party. Maybe they can all have a little bit of fun. So give it a try. Think it over. If you make some discoveries, I'd love to know about it. This exercise and this prompt is inspired by the strength exercise in the Tarot for Creative Spirits workbook, which has journaling and creative prompts for every card in the tarot. This book is like a full course in tarot study, but you get to learn through your own experience and your own embodiment and your own creativity. It's got illustrations. Uh, it's filled with great questions. You really get to know yourself on a deeper level. And like I always say, self-knowledge is the key to making more powerful magic. So you can find that in our shop at typewritertarot.com. I'll put a discount code in the show notes if you want to save some money. Um, thanks for listening. We'll be back with another interview episode on The Hermit coming soon. And I will talk to you then. Take care. <laughs>